Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Data Epoch. We have Matthias Boom here with us today. He is a full professor for large-scale data engineering at TU Berlin and the Bifold Research Center. His cross-organizational research group focuses on high-level data science-centric abstractions as well as systems and tools to execute these tasks in an efficient and scalable manner. From 2018 through 2022, Matthias was a BMK endowed professor for data management at Graz University of Technology, Austria, and a research area manager for data management at the co-located No Center GmbH. Prior to joining TU Graz in 2018, he was a research staff member at IBM Almeda Research Center with a major focus on compilation and runtime techniques for declarative large-scale machine learning in Apache System ML. Matthias received his PhD from Dresden University of Technology, Germany in 2011 with a dissertation on cost-based optimization of integration flows. So thank you very much for being here today. It's great having you. Yeah, it's all my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So how did you get into the data or ML space and specifically how did you choose to get into research in it? It's actually a non-linear path that's, that I had. Uh, so I would say it started really uh, in the middle of my PhD thesis. Uh, so my PhD thesis was on the cost-based optimization of message-oriented middle flow and integration flows, how to uh, yeah, reduce the latency, improve throughput, integrating heterogeneous operational systems. And uh, then in the middle of my PhD, I got a second project, which was an EU funded project called Mirable. And in this particular project, I was the work package lead for time series forecasting. So the idea of this project was actually very compelling of uh, saying, how can we increase the amount of renewable energy sources in the energy mix? And uh, the core idea was if users could express their flexibility when to consume energy. So instead of saying, I want to charge my electric vehicle, you say, I want my electric vehicle charged by 9 a.m. in the morning, which gives this flexibility of an amount until a certain deadline, propagating this to a central location, and then there's some scheduling going on uh, that takes into account the forecast for wind for photovoltaic energy and essentially places the energy demand um, places where you have more renewable energy sources. And energy companies actually ran in studies and uh, found out they can increase by up to 9% the, uh, the fraction of renewable energy sources in the energy mix. So that was nice. Meanwhile, uh, a group, uh, so a partner from this project from Alburg University actually also created a startup, which is still existing right now, 10 years later. Um, uh, so that really brought me into the space. And then I helped out for various lectures in at Theo Dresden and uh, running a lecture called Data Integration and uh, Large Scale Analysis, which had data warehousing, then various kinds of how to integrate different systems, but in the second part also uh, advanced analytics or clustering, association, rule mining, classification. And uh, well, the best way of learning things is actually to teach others. So in that context, well, you read up a lot of things, you build up your background for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, well, I ended my PhD. And uh, so uh, as other side projects, I was also working on uh, uh, so in-memory indexing and query processing. And then it, uh, so I defended my PhD in 2011. And in 2011, at the major German database conference, uh, Schiff uh, by Nanatan, um, who was a senior manager at IBM later of my, myself, uh, gave a keynote on system ML on essentially an, a declarative abstraction. How can you separate uh, how to craft and customize machine learning algorithms from the actual physical data structures, uh, is it local or distributed, and how to actually compile plans for that. So I was really intrigued by this uh, talk and 
Well, I never studied abroad during my own studies. So then I moved into the U.S. and uh, oh, I wanted to move in the U.S. and interviewed with a couple of companies. One was IBM Research Almaden. And there they had a couple of projects potentially in mind. And then it was just the perfect fit for me to essentially take my background on compiler technology of time series forecasting and actual data structures and compilation techniques and uh, utilize that in the system ML project. So I was lucky then to start as a postdoc, later become a research staff member and really working on system ML as a system for a large scale distributed machine learning training and um, actually still work on derivative systems that followed after system ML. So that's kind of the non-linear journey to that. Oh, very cool. So what are some of the current problems or needs in the data and ML space that you think the community needs to research and come up with solutions to? It's a, it's a, a wide uh, field and uh, very heterogeneous. So in my group, we are giving actually specialized master uh, courses on the architecture of machine learning systems where we look at the entire stack from language abstractions all the way down to hardware accelerators and horizontally from uh, data prep, data integration, uh, cleaning provenance over model training all the way to deployment in different environments. Uh, so I just pick, so it's really, I, I cannot uh, cover a complete kind of picture here, uh, but a couple of major trends I would uh, I would highlight is on the one end of the spectrum, it's really specialized hardware, uh, where people try to leverage reconfigurable hardware like FPGAs, but also building custom chips, so uh, application-specific integrated circuits and uh, the necessary compiler stack for that, uh, to really then, for a given architecture, really compile this down into whatever reconfigurable primitives in the hardware you have, Mm -hmm. uh, to get better trade-offs of performance, energy efficiency, and uh, really specialized to the use case that you're actually having. So this entire area, specialized hardware, I would point out. The second major topic is uh, the large space of data preparation um, uh, alignment. Uh, so my group also worked with use cases in recycling, but also autonomous vehicles where uh, you get multimodal data sets. And uh, so, for example, in autonomous vehicles, you get times irregular time series from the entire CAN bus system of the car, uh, then you get video streams left, right, front, rear. Uh, you get additional metadata where people described how, how it behaved. And uh, now aligning that is uh, often a spatial temporal problem already that uh, uh, in other scenarios, like in recycling, you have sensors mounted at certain locations and objects flowing through the space. Uh, but in order to apply ML, you have to first create an object-centric kind of representation where you get the sensor values whenever the object was at that particular location. And uh, so that is already a major integration problem. And then more often than not, you have problems. So incorrect sensor values uh, just incorrectly entered data. So it's uh, very interesting, even if you look at data sets like DBLP uh, that are highly curated data sets, uh, there are just uh, data issues in it, data issues that originate from automated processes of getting the metadata from individual institutions, for example, and then see those typical things of attribute swaps, for example, where people entered it in around fields in some web forms, and it's just in a different location, you get outliers, you get missing values, and we have to deal with those. Uh, combined with data prep, alignment, cleaning is also the entire topic of how do we generate, given a small set of labeled instances, how do we generate synthetic examples uh, to better cover the entire space our model should generalize to? So this entire space of data augmentation, domain randomization, if you have a very small kind of domain, then you can actually randomize and really try to cover the space by randomly generating colors and objects and things. Um, uh, then 
So we had data prep, we had specialized hardware. Uh, the third major trend I would point out is sparsity exploitation. And that's something uh, that we see from algorithms all the way down to the hardware accelerators. Uh, so at algorithm level, people similar to lasso regression, where we take the uh, L1 norm of the weights into the loss function as a penalty term. So if a weight, non-zero weight, uh, it, is, it does not reduce the loss very much, then it's better to actually drive this to zero as a means of feature selection. Now, similarly, if you have a neural network, you can imagine essentially the weight matrices on every layer. And uh, so including the either the non-zeros or the L1 norm of those weights into loss functions is a one way of driving weights to zero. Uh, which reduces the number of floating point operations in scoring then uh, where it's often applied. And then people have all sorts of interesting variations of that because hardware accelerators like GPUs are very bad normally at ex, uh, or working with those irregular sparse representations. So people impose additional structure like uh, force a block of three by three weights into zero or not. And so you have those different schemes of sparsity exploitation. Then at system level, it's more and more different data structures, how you actually represent sparse matrices and tensors and how you run kernels on top of that. And then it goes down to the hardware, where, for example, uh, the A100s, um, so Ampere architecture GPUs, uh, they added the ability to, for a block of four values, take the only the two largest quantities, uh, make them essentially dense, then again, uh, and having a there are semi-sparse representations. So you know essentially per row how many non-zeros you have, because for every four values, you take exactly two values, but it's still a gator operation from where to read the debates, but it's then somewhat sparsifying it in the hardware accelerator. Uh, so that's something we expect more and more to, to actually happen in the future. Maybe two additional topics I want to point out. One is um, the entire space of AutoML, neural architecture search, hyperperimeter optimization, and in general, learned data structures and, and um, optimization algorithms and models, actually. Uh, so this entire space of how can we uh, find uh, Pareto optimal points in terms of multiple objectives, such as uh, I want to have a neural network that has a low number of floating point operations uh, for actual predictions, but at the same time, I want to get reasonably high accuracy. And there are a couple of great data sets that people created to make, uh, because this is a resource intensive problem to actually uh, devise those kinds of techniques. Um, having benchmark data sets that can then be simulated, it's much quicker uh, research those kinds of topics is very, uh, is a great direction. And then most cloud vendors all kind of customize and specialize their AutoML uh, solutions right now. And there were a couple of recent works where people uh, then learned essentially the optimization algorithms So this recent work where uh, people then learn kind of tree-based tree -based structures and ensemble models. Um, uh, so this is uh, optimization and then finally deployment, I think, and my group also worked a little bit on that, um, uh, specialized deployments such as federated learning where uh, you try to counter privacy concerns or issues, data ownership by leaving the data where it is and actually learning models um, without centrally consolidating the data. So uh, there are multiple it's a huge trend where essentially, um, of course, similar to a pyramid server, you can initialize a model, push the model down, make a forward backward pass, compute gradients, and then only send the gradients as aggregates. And then there are all sorts of, um, and what I tell my students always is the spectrum of data sharing. On the one hand side, you have public data, just send it out and consolidate it. On the other side, you have perfectly private data, and you might only share it with partners in a secure network. But then you have this entire spectrum of uh, different techniques with different uh, security guarantees, performance overhead and different um, utility for actually the trained model. So there are techniques that actually model noise on top of it, which reduces the utility, but increases the, the privacy that you have of not recovering your raw data. And federated learning has actually a very interesting, very practical um, design point in the spectrum of uh, sharing aggregates, um, 
Uh, so you can't reveal the raw data. Uh, so you learn about data distributions while being very practical. So we've shown it uh, that uh, so so there's this entire space of uh, federated parameter servers, uh, but also how to compile linear algebra programs, so tensor computations, uh, including pre-processing model debugging into those federated environments. And we believe that's that's very important. But similarly, there are other deployments, so in cloud infrastructures that require dedicated um, modifications of the underlying ML system stack. So there are a couple of works on how can we build ML systems on top of serverless infrastructures, uh, how can we utilize certain uh, specific hardware environments? And that is very important. But uh, as you see, this is a huge stack. And uh, I came to the conclusion that it's really about, uh, for the next 10 years, thinking about those um, what are the right abstractions that we don't end up in an all pairs problem where uh, we essentially have so many specialized things that it becomes increasingly hard to actually fully utilize those things and uh, for a complex ML pipeline deploy that in practice. Um, but those are a couple of areas that we find interesting and in some of them we are also um, actively working on. Yeah, you provided with a wide range of problems that need to be solved towards, you know, getting a standardized practices in the industry. So if I had to like summarize those some of them would be with respect to the machine practices, like how do you customize, have a, a common framework and then customize per use case. And then we may have a, a spectrum of data uh, types, uh, types in the sense that some of them might be from public resources, unplanned, noisy, and others might have higher private, uh, private privacy, security, and PII concerns. So how do you treat them all together? And then there's also the representation learning in terms of dense or sparse and sort of balancing those as well as, you know, uh, balancing high performing models versus the carbon footprint sort of problems. How did I miss anything? No, so those, those are major major areas. Um, the specialized hardware, I, I think, would uh, I would explicitly mention that because it's a huge field which is uh, often underappreciated uh, because we only see the device and well, it's there now, uh, but there's often a multi-year development design process, and more and more uh, people try to apply ML for the design process, so chip placement and layout optimization. I mean, it was same automated for a long long time uh, but finding new and interesting shapes um, so I've read papers where uh, really the design was then rather uh, spherical because uh, that shortened the wire uh, wires that you needed and um, uh, kind of as an alternative exploring that I think is very valuable as well but in general specialized hardware is certainly increasingly important um, given the hardware challenges and physical limits we're facing. Yeah. yeah, got it. So which of these directions is your group currently tackling with and how? That's a good question. So um, we actually try to cover multiple points in this entire design space. Um, uh, so we are trying to build up a larger research group where uh, we do system-oriented research. So we have two major flagship systems, system the Apache System DS and Daphne. Uh, Apache System DS focusing on the end-to-end -end data science lifecycle, really from data preparation, cleaning, distributed training, all the way to model debugging and deployment, uh, where we, in the last three years, actually added this entire federated runtime backend as well. And Daphne being an MLIR-based uh, ML system that is geared and tries to better support integrated data analysis pipelines that have query processing, machine learning uh, components, but then also high-performance computing and numerical simulations in them. Now, across those two systems uh, that are, so Daphne being more geared toward heterogeneous hardware, and uh, essentially we try to make an open and extensible system infrastructure, Apache system, yes, much more mature, much more primitives already existing, and uh, something we can actually utilize in end-to-end -end, uh, ML applications, having more primitives for data preparation, cleaning, and where we really try to provide those primitives that we optimize internally 
and make them useful for users. So to answer your question, we do system-oriented research with those two kinds of systems. And in that space, um, our PhD students actually try to cover the space very well. Just to highlight a few works, we have, for example, multiple works on uh, data alignment and data cleaning. So for data cleaning, for the last two years, we devised a framework that essentially enumerates data cleaning pipelines. So different primitives for outlier detection, uh, missing value imputation, and um, for different categories of data and different constraints a user might, might optionally provide us. Uh, and then automatically tune the hyperparameters. So uh, many of the primitives actually have hyperparameters. So outlier detection, a simple technique is uh, outlier removal by IQR, where you take the interquartile range between the uh, uh, first and third quartile, and you scale it by a certain parameter, and everything outside that range is deemed uh, outlier and dropped off for more well-behaved training. Now, this parameter is highly data dependent. So what we are doing is really uh, we are taking the ML application and uh, the accuracy on the validation set as a signal how good certain parameterizations are. So we simultaneously essentially enumerate those pipelines and then tune the hyperparameters of those cleaning primitives to devise uh, essentially a good uh, pipeline. And it uh, actually works uh, very well. And even compared to auto SQL learn, we see still improvements because auto ML frameworks right now do not fully integrate those data cleaning primitives, but merely pre-processing, scaling, normalization. Uh, so we believe integrating then those kinds of cleaning primitives into auto ML frameworks will also be very important. Now, in this space, um, uh, we also do some work on data alignment. So there are a couple of problems I mentioned earlier already, uh, the use cases where we actually face those problems. And we recently started to first systematically evaluate existing methods and then trying to improve upon those methods. Uh, then in terms of efficient system infrastructure, there are really two main projects uh, beside federated learning that we are working on. Uh, one is provenance and essentially tracing lineage while you're executing things for reproducibility, uh, but then also leveraging uh, this lineage trace, which uniquely identifies intermediates as a key in a reuse cache to do very fine-grained uh, essentially reuse of intermediates, because if uh, we are composing more and more complex ML pipelines, redundancy is inevitable. So if uh, essentially it's a, a good mental model is you have your training and scoring and uh, now for hyperparameter tuning, for model selection, for feature selection, for data augmentation, for data cleaning, you wrap outer and outer and outer loops around that, viewing essentially the core algorithms as black boxes. Once, you, once the compiler breaks them up, you suddenly see a lot of operational redundancy. So doing eliminating this redundancy automatically uh, is for us a very important direction. And we had uh, work where we do full reuse of intermediates, but also partial reuse where you computed part of a tensor and then you only compute the compensations remaining columns. Uh, so if you think of feature selection that you might have computed certain intermediates and now you appended a column, you might only have to, to compute those compensations. Uh, then the second major direction is um, in general exploiting data redundancy. So I talked about uh, sparsity a little bit. Um, the more general form of that is data redundancy. Uh, so it's not just the non-zero values, but also in general, how many distinct items do you have in different columns? So if you have structural input data, we actually have categories. Uh, representing this as numerical data and just purely running numerical computations is unnecessarily inefficient uh, because first you can compress them uh, by just storing the dictionaries of distinct items and uh, devising uh, compression schemes that can represent your matrix or tensor in a much smaller uh, size reducing memory bandwidth requirements for elementwise operations that are uh, where the operational uh, requirements are much, much slower than, or much, much lower than uh, the time needed for actually reading and writing the data. 
And in addition to that, we are applying things like, for example, column co-coding, where you take a couple of highly correlated columns, uh, you encode them as tuples in a dictionary, and every tuple is then only represented with a single pointer in this dictionary, for example. So I'm currently referring just to dictionary coding, but we have like hundreds of specialized uh, column representations. And uh, essentially utilizing that, uh, we can reduce the number of floating point operations by pre-aggregating on the dictionary. And then only for every pre-aggregated value, adding this to the output once instead of uh, for all those correlated columns. Uh, now, right now we are focusing, while mainstream is focusing primarily on lossy compression, which is useful and um, uh, however creates trust con concerns, especially in those complex uh, pipelines where uh, applying loss compression is often still a trial and error process. Does it work for my application or not? I give it a try, uh, but there are no guarantees and you don't know what, what happens really if you, you have unseen data. And in our case, uh, we see that even with lossless compression, we already can get a lot of benefits. And this compressed representation is in a sense a generalization of dense or sparse representations. And if you think about missing value imputations, so the most simplistic missing value imputation is imputation by mean or mode, for example, uh, which are constant values. And that is exactly the redundancy that you get completely rid of uh, by compression while preserving the semantics of what you imputed there. Yeah? Um, and then in the, the deployment space, we, we uh, essentially focus on federated learning with multiple different projects, such as uh, given privacy constraints of a user, how can you actually compile dedicated, dedicated plans that adhere to those privacy constraints that certain columns cannot be shared in a raw form, but only in aggregated form, uh, but finding the, the optimal plan subject to those constraints. There are uh, other works in this space, but ultimately we uh, want to integrate then also more heavyweight schemes such as uh, homomorphic encryption, where you can apply certain operations, multiplies and adds on this encrypted representation. So we have for federated pyramid or service actually in our systems integrated a multi-key homomorphic encryption, but just for uh, the gradient exchange, um, uh, but for the general case, we also want to integrate this into those automatic cost-based optimized plans uh, where we compile the optimal plan and primitives for, for essentially privacy preserving ML. So to summarize, it's really in the data prep space, we have quite a number of works uh, utilizing essentially data preparation for machine learning. Uh, and then in the internals of ML system, quite a number of different strategies and uh, deployment in terms of especially focused on federated learning. So uh, that's for the last one and a half, two years. And um, in the future, we really focus on four major topics. One is really uh, data preparation and specializing data engineering uh, for specific domains. It's uh, specializing for a workload in those complex integrated data analysis pipelines, then specializing for data representations and specializing for deployments. Those are the four main topics for the foreseeable future here in, in Berlin. Awesome. So the topics that you just mentioned are like very practical and very useful. And, you know, mm -hmm. in addition to just contributing to the progress of the science, the data science itself, uh, this is also a very practical underlying and providing standard practices that helps sort of carry and implement and uh, realize the usefulness of the science. So what would be your advice to other research teams that, you know, want to gain that balance of research as well as practicality and, you know, application? That's an excellent question, and uh, I try to answer it. Uh, I'm not sure if I have the full answer myself, but I'm certainly striving for it. Uh, I think the the reason why why it went very well for me at uh, IBM Research I Martin was because I found somewhat this balance between building systems and um, 
simultaneously then stepping back because while building a system, we often solve certain things very pragmatically. Via heuristics, it needs to run tomorrow morning and whatever it takes right now, I want this running. Um, but then stepping back and saying, okay, how, if I would want to solve this in a principle, more principled way, how would we approach that? And defining that way, then essentially more foundational research projects uh, that's potentially together with students, so in my case at IBM, I served this then with summer interns where we had very good graduate students that came in and helped us build new prototypes for certain components. And uh, while the actual system was still working, so it was of the critical part, uh, but then they made very great contributions and often we reintegrated the, the outcomes then and wrote the, the VLDB Sigma uh, papers uh, about that. So that way we wrote fewer papers because well, work, doing system-oriented research uh, takes a lot of time to actually build it, and uh, but those papers are more grounded, I would say. So uh, I changed over time essentially my publication strategy of focusing on fewer but, but better papers and actually trying to implement them. And I think it would serve the entire community very well if we all would write a little bit fewer papers, so quality over quantity, and um, because otherwise people can anyway not pick up on it and uh, essentially uh, utilize all those ideas. And it's much more valuable for other people if those ideas have actually been tried out in sufficiently many experiments and actually implemented, uh, because we all have ideas. What we're interested in, however, are ideas that actually worked well and uh, somewhat proved to be effective. Yeah. Awesome. And outside work, what do you enjoy and get inspired by? Um, I would uh, mention two things, actually. So uh, concurrently to, to being a PhD student and previously, before that in, in school, I played for 25 years, actually, soccer. And what I learned out of that and reflecting now a little bit back is that uh, playing in, a, in such a team sport is not that different from uh, doing system-oriented research. So we can learn a lot from that. Uh, so in in uh, such a team sport like soccer, you need very different characters on the individual uh, positions. And similarly, when building larger systems, we don't need this one person and replicate this person, but we need a more developer-focused person, a person who is interested in research and trying to experiment with certain ideas. And uh, so that's also how I, I try to hire my teams and uh, uh, what I did in the past and in the future to have this balance and with that get more ideas into what we're doing. So that somewhat inspired the private life, inspired a little bit uh, how we are trying to run our systems projects. And the second major thing is I'm really still very enjoying art projects at a wide variety of different categories. And I think what we can learn from that is uh, the combination of different styles and things and recombination over time. The same is actually often happening in research that sometimes very, very good novel ideas. So very few ideas are really novel. Most of the good ideas are actually combinations of ideas either combinations or transferring one technique from one domain into another domain or context that would have never been expected, where it suddenly also works very well. So this uh, kind of a little bit of neuroplasticity of thinking outside the box and thinking across things and how we can combine things, I think that's something that we can get inspired and learn from art a little bit. Those are really nice analogies and, you know, inspirations that you're drawing. Um, thank you very much for this very yeah, insightful nice. podcast. There's just so much we exactly. need to think about in this area um, to, you know, get a structured progress here. So thank you very mm -hmm. much, Matthias. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.